Champollion was not frightened. He was also not distracted by the idea of hieroglyphs as pictorial metaphors. Instead, using the insights of a brilliant English physicist named Thomas Young, he proceeded something like this. This is an exact replica of the Rosetta Stone. The original had been found in the year 1799 by a French soldier working on the fortifications of the Nile Delta town of Rashid, which the Europeans, in their persistence not to learn Arabic, called Rosetta. It had been part of a, an ancient temple which had been torn down. If we look at it, we see that it clearly represents the same text in three different languages. Up at the top, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. In the middle, a kind of cursive and later hieroglyphic called demotic. And down at the bottom, the key to the enterprise, Greek. Champollion could, of course, read ancient Greek. He was a superb linguist. And discovered that this stone had been inscribed to commemorate the coronation of King Ptolemy V Epiphanes in the spring of the year 196 BC. As we would expect, the Greek text includes many references to King Ptolemy. Here, for example, you can see it. Ptolemaios. Now, in roughly the same positions, but in the hieroglyphic text, are these ovals, or cartouches, as they're called. And if this cartouche really means Ptolemy, then the individual hieroglyphs are unlikely to be pictograms or metaphors, much more likely they're letters, or at least syllables. In addition, Champollion had the presence of mind to count up the number of Greek words and the number of individual hieroglyphics in what are presumably equivalent texts. He found that the number of individual hieroglyphs is much larger than the number of Greek words again implying that the hieroglyphs are mainly letters and syllables. But which hieroglyphs correspond to which letters? Fortunately, Champollion had available to him a kind of second Rosetta Stone, an obelisk which had been excavated at the Temple of Philae, and which had inscribed upon it cartouches representing the hieroglyphic equivalent of another Greek name, Cleopatra. So here we have the Cleopatra cartouche, and here is the Ptolemaeus cartouche. Here we've turned it around, changing left to right to right to left, and spread the hieroglyphs out so we can see them all. Now, immediately we notice that there are some similarities. This first hieroglyph in Ptolemy is a kind of square. The fifth hieroglyph in Cleopatra is a square, but Cleopatra. Atra, both of them seem to represent a P. So Ptolemy and Cleopatra both give us the same interpretation. A square is a P. Likewise, the fourth hieroglyph in Ptolemy is a lion. Tol, P-T-O-L. Likewise, the second hieroglyph in Cleopatra is an L. So again, it's consistent. The pattern is emerging. Likewise, this rope or hangman's noose, Ptolemy, it's an O. Cleopatra, it's an O. And in this way, Champollion was able to assign letters for each of the hieroglyphs we see here. Ptolemais and likewise, Cleopatra, the eagle is an A. You notice there are two different symbols for T, but in English, same sort of thing, F and PH. Champollion discovered that the hieroglyphics were basically a simple substitution cipher. Now, there's other stuff in here. All the rest of this in the cartouche, what's that about? Well, he was later able to find out. This is a symbol called the Ankh, which means life. Here, there's a P-T, that's a Ch, makes Ptach, name of a god. And the whole cartouche read, Ptolemy, ever-living, beloved of the god Ptach. 
Likewise, the end of the Cleopatra is a short form meaning daughter of Isis. So it turns out that Champollion's opponents were not wholly wrong. Some of the hieroglyphs, for example, the symbol Ankh, which means life, are ideograms or pictograms, but the key to the enterprise, Champollion's success rested on his realization that the hieroglyphs were essentially letters and syllables. In retrospect, it sounds almost easy, but it took people hundreds of years before they figured it out.